The following sermon is by Manny Alaniz, pastor at St. Stephen's Chapel in Northwest San Antonio, Texas. For more information, for prayer, or to support us financially, please visit our website at ststephenschapel.org or call us at 210-241-5969. And the Lord, our God, is in our midst. Let us prepare our hearts to hear God's truth, which comes through the preaching of his word. And that begins with prayer. Let us pray together. Oh, Heavenly Father, we have gathered in your presence, recognizing the sacredness of this very moment. We come before you with anticipation and an expectation, knowing that you have a word to speak to us today. We acknowledge that your word is living and active, capable of piercing through the barriers of our hearts and transforming us within. Help us to be recipients of the truth that you bring, that you reveal to us. Grant us the strength to respond in obedience to your will. In Christ we pray. Amen. Please be seated. The uh, years ago, when I was 20, that wasn't a long time ago, but it was years ago when I was 20. I was attending, and, and I'm going to bring back another DPS story, but it, it's so applicable to our passage, okay? When I was attending the DPS Academy to be trained as a state trooper, I was 20 years old. No one ever listened to me. My sisters never paid attention to me. I was kind of lost in the shuffle, young. And they were training us about, uh, to, to carry out the laws of the state of Texas, to go out and enforce the laws of the state of Texas. Now, many of us, me and others, other cadets, wondered to ourselves, and then finally we asked, why would anybody pay attention to us? Now, why would anyone pay attention to what this young kid that doesn't know what he's doing or doesn't look like he knows what he's doing, why should we pay attention to him? Now, some wisecrackers in our academy would say, well, we, because we got a gun or something like that. It's crazy stuff or a badge. But we knew better than that. Why would anyone pay attention to what we had to stay. So we got a response. Uh, the response was, it's not so much us wearing a badge that people will uh, respect our authority. It is what stands behind the badge, this, the, the power of the, of the state of Texas, the laws of the state of Texas. That's what they're submitting to. That's what they're they're, they're, they're submitting to the authority of the laws of the state of Texas. That's what they're giving into. That's why they're going to, most of the time, uh, do what we ask them to do or whatever. So that kind of gave us a little confidence. It's not so much they're looking at me. They're looking at the power, so to speak, that stands behind me, which is the, the, the laws of the state of Texas. Now, when we think about the laws of the state of Texas, you start wondering, well, where do they come from? Or where do they originate? Where did, who, who decided to write all this down? And, and we find out rather quickly that, uh, that the laws of the, of the state of Texas were copied from other states, were taken from other places, other states, even the federal government. It's, and, they're, and they were written down so they could be enforced within our state. So you start wondering, well, let's go back some more. Where did the, the federal government come up with all these laws? And where did the other states come up with it? Well, it doesn't take us long to find out that the federal government, the US, United States of America, they, they base their constitution and the laws from other countries, other places, other countries that have been around forever. So they copied and tweaked and based it on those, they based the laws on those other countries, other, other uh, municipalities, if you will. But then you start, and then you go back even further than that. So where did 
those laws come from? Where did somebody come to write all this stuff down to keep order, to, to, to control the behavior of people? Where did that come from? Where did that originate? Well, the answer to that is the basis of all the law that govern human behavior can be traced all the way back to moral law, to moral law. Moral law uh, is the, the, the law that, that's, in, that's innate, that, that, is, that, is, that we're born, that's born within us, that, that the natural law that embedded in us by a supreme being, by our creator, by God himself. That is where they're basing their laws on. I mean, it is natural to think that you just can't go over there and shoot somebody or take somebody's possession. There's just something innately wrong with that. And all societies believe that. Now, you're going to run across some weird societies that believe weird things or, or individuals that believe weird stuff. But that's the exception. The rule is this. Everyone realizes there's certain things that cannot be done, that, that you cannot do. Uh, everyone believes that in order to, to keep chaos from occurring, we have to abide by certain rules, laws, and those laws can be traced back to the moral law that God embedded in us. That moral law was written down, and it was given to God's people. It was given to God's people in the wilderness. We refer to that, the moral law, as the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. They were written down on a tablet by the finger of God, given to his people. And it was given to the people not to save them. God had already rescued them from their slavery. It was given to his people so they could so they could. So, they, so he could control them. They did not look like his people. They did not act like his people. They were acting like, they were acting in chaos. They were being disobedient to even the moral law that people would know about, that everybody would know about. So God writes the Ten Commandments and he gives them, gives them to his people. Now, all the other laws that are written are based on those commandments. Think about it. Now, we can write more specific laws. We can get in more details. We can get into all this, but they're all coming back. It all comes back to the commandments, the Ten Commandments that God gave his people. So when we talk about the law, we're not speaking about the law. When any of us talk about the law, when I spoke about the law as a trooper, we're not speaking about that I am the author of the law no, no, I am just a conveyant. I'm just enforcing the law. I didn't write the law. I don't come to people and say, hey, look, I got a law. I wrote a law that says you can't steal from that person or you can't kill that person. I mean, it's, I, mean I'm, that, I have no authority like that. My authority is basically to enforce the law. But what if? What if? Someone came and started speaking with great authority regarding the decrees of the law. What if a person, a man, started speaking as though he wrote the law, as though he wrote the moral law? What if this man spoke in the first person regarding the law, and then this man explains the law, the intent of the law, the spirit of the law to us so that we can get a better understanding of the law. What if this man makes reference to himself when explaining the law? Saying things like, you've heard it said, to those of old, you shall not murder. And, who, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. 
And then this man says this. He says, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. What if this man, by his authority, pronounced blessings on people? Uh, by his authority, what if he pronounced blessings on people, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And so forth. What if? This man was not merely speaking about the law. He is speaking with us as though he is the authority. He is the law. Would you be astonished? Would you be astonished? Or would you think this man is insane? Would you be astonished? This evening, we have reached the end of our journey through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. But please understand that it, by no mistake, it is by no mistake that the writer, the author, the writer who was inspired by the power of the Holy Spirit, by no mistake has placed this passage at the very end. It is by no mistake that what we're looking at today is placed at the very end of the sermon, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Why? Well, we are now being directed to the preacher of the sermon and not the sermon itself. Now he's taking, we, we heard a lot of stuff during the sermon that Jesus is preaching, and now we're being directed to the preacher of the sermon. Our focus is now on the preacher, and that is intentional. The majestic, astounding teachings of Jesus reveal his authority over creation, for he is Emmanuel. Thus, obedience to his word will draw us nearer to him. Obedience to his word draws us nearer to him. The critical issue we must not that we the critical issue of these these two verses is that we must not make a distinction. We must not make a distinction between the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus Himself. We cannot separate them. We have to know that it is God. It is God speaking, Emmanuel. It is God speaking to us. It is God speaking to you. It is God telling you, you must be obedient. You must be obedient. Blessed are. You know, you are the, the, the light of the world, the salt of the earth. I mean, this is God speaking to us. And we're being told now that, he, that this, this person preaching has the authority because he is the authority. And you cannot make a distinction between what he is saying and the person who is preaching that he is God. He is Emmanuel. God with us. And it's interesting when we look at the word, the, the phrase Emmanuel, God with us. Now, according to the theologians, the great theologians that, that we read, that we study, but just according to what we read in Scripture, Emmanuel is, frequ is frequently used throughout Holy Scripture to denote that he, God, is present with his people, with us, that he is present with us, that, with his people. Now, that is amazing in and of itself, the creator of heaven and earth, things that are seen and unseen, of all you can imagine, is with us, is with us, is with his people. In Christ, the Lord, the Lord's grace is upon us. He displays his power, the power of his hand in our defense. 
What is our defense? What does that mean? Like in, in our defense? Well, in our defense, because we're sinners. And because we're sinners, we're condemned to sin. And now in our defense, he is sent. He has given us his grace, his word. And now through the word, through the logos, the word became flesh through Christ himself. God communicates with us through his divine word and through his son, Jesus Christ. For when we are out of Christ, we are alienated from God. When we're not in Christ, we are alienated from God. Think about your life. Think about the times when you know you weren't walking in fellowship with the Lord. Do you believe when, it, when, it, when God's word says that you're alienated from God? Yeah, it's easy to believe because there's no telling what we were involved in. There's no telling what we were thinking about. It's, there's no telling what we would do. We were alienated. We were estranged from God. But through Christ, we are not only received into God's favor, we are also made one with Christ. One with Christ. Uh, we, we, we sometimes, many of us have, throughout the years, have heard these phrases being thrown around, and they just kind of escape us. They escape us. They escape us. We cannot let them escape us now. Just see now that the Spirit is on us. We must allow the spirit to, to to penetrate our souls into what's being said in his word, what's being said here. Before Jesus came in the flesh, God's people were under the law. They were called to be obedient to the law. Where uh, And they were nearer to God. When they were nearer to God, uh, they were nearer to God because of shadows, because of figures, so to speak because of the ark, because of different things that God had put in place. There were shadows, but in Christ, that is, in God incarnate, the actual presence of God is now with his people in the flesh. God in the flesh. For this reason, the Apostle Paul says in Colossians 2, verse 19, that in him, he's talking about Jesus, in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead, of the Godhead, bodily, bodily. That Jesus is the qualified mediator because he is, because of his natures, two natures, the divine nature and the human nature, he is now the mediator between the Almighty and humanity. He is the mediator. So here's a big question that we need to ponder. Why should we care and do the things that we are called to do in this sermon, in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount? Why? Well, the answer is obvious. I've been hammering at it here for the last few minutes. Because of the authority of the person who is preaching this sermon. The Sermon on the Mount is more than teaching. It, it is more than doctrine. It is more than theology. The Sermon on the Mount brings us into relationship with Christ himself, with the Son of God himself. Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God with us. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, God is in us. Christ is in us. As we reflect on the text regarding the authority, the authority of Christ, we, we, we can clearly see that we see the authority in his words as we look at this, this, as we've looked at the Sermon on the Mount, and the authority of his works, of the person, his works. And we've, we've taken a, a look already at, at some of the things that he taught in, the, in his Sermon on the Mount, and it clearly it clearly displays his authority, the authority of his words, and it touches on the, the power of his authority, the power of the words that Jesus uses. And it is fascinating. It's fascinating to see in the last two warnings of, of, this, of, this, of his sermon 
how Jesus uses the first person pronoun. He uses I, he says me, he says my, he says mine. Uh, theologian uh, Friedrich uh, Bruner wrote this. He says, they uncover the sermon's most astonishing dimension that Jesus believes himself to be in the vernacular something different, something else. Yeah, he is something different, something else. He is God. God in human flesh. Jesus warns us. He makes statements like this in his warnings. And we cannot overlook. And, and, and believe me, they were not overlooked when he actually preached it to the disciples that were there. See, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, or he says something like, I never knew you. He goes on to say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of lawlessness. Jesus goes on to say things like, many people will say to me on that day, and I will say. Again, using the first person you know, pronoun. Everyone who listens to these words of mine and does them again first person everyone who is listening to these words of mine and does not do them again talking in the first person jesus assumes for himself the place that the torah the torah the law assigns to god that's what he's doing when he's doing that he he is placing himself in the place where the Torah, the law of God, has assigned to God, to God only. That's where he's placing himself. Yet Jesus continues as he continues his ministry, as he goes on after the Sermon on the Mount. He continues with a God-centered ministry. He refers to the Father, God the Father. Personally, there is a relationship there. It's certainly a revelation of the triune God found in the person of Christ, our Lord. We must not overlook the astonishing reality that Jesus is speaking as if he already has the authority. He is speaking as if he already has the authority, and he does. He is from eternity past. He's always existed. But, he, but in time and space, in our history, he became human. He was born of a virgin. He became flesh and bones like us. He breathed air. He ate food. He became human. That's astonishing. Ask yourself, who other than God could speak like this? Who other than God could speak like this? It is God. It's God himself. Jesus is truly Emmanuel, God with us. I recently uh, read an article the other day. It was about a, a survey, a nationwide survey that was taken back on, on, you know, on May 11th, May 11th through the 15th of 2023. And it was done, it was conducted by a research institute from the University of Chicago, okay, Don, okay, it's, just still, it's still good you know, information, just kidding, but it was taken by a research institute from the University of Chicago called the AP NORCI, N-O-R-C. The survey revealed that there are more Americans today who believe in angels than they do hell or the devil. More than we try to we try to just absorb what, what what we're being told here. There's more Americans today that believe in angels than they do hell or the devil. According to the survey, nearly 70 percent of Americans believe in the existence of angels, and the same percentage believe in heaven. But there were more 
that 72 percent who believed in the power of prayer. And see, that's a little confusing to me because you have 70 percent thinking, you know, they believe in in angels and they believe in heaven, and you have 72 percent that believe in the power of prayer. That tells a lot, I guess, in, in, in very many different ways. The survey stated that 58% of the people polled believed in hell. So you got 72% believe in heaven, and only 58% believe in hell or the devil. And, it, and the, the, the article makes a good observation. It says that this type of believism, this type of believism is referred to as cafeteria style, cafeteria style religion. And what does that mean? Well, it means that you just pick and choose what you want to believe. You just pick and choose what you want to believe. How many people, you know anybody like that? They just pick and choose what they want to believe. And they may be even a part of a church, and they may even be reading scripture or heard scripture. And they'll say stuff like, well, I don't, you know, I don't know if I believe that, so I'm not going to take that. I'm going to just believe this here. I'm going to believe that there. I'm going to believe in angels. I'm not going to believe in the, I'm not going to believe in the devil. The demonic forces. Ah, nah. That's too gross. Let me just leave that there. Hey, we're creating our religion. And, and they, the same thing goes with their belief in Christ. They just believe certain things. They're, they're creating an idol. They're creating their own what? Jesus. They're creating their own idol. That's what's interesting about the survey. When we venture to say, uh, and we would venture to say, or I would venture to say, that most of these people that were surveyed were probably Christian or self-proclaimed Christian. But the problem is that they're encountering, uh, they're, the, the problem being encountered by these people is that they neither read nor do they believe in the authority and the power of the words of Christ, of the words of Jesus. They neither believe in the authority and the power of Jesus, nor do they read or believe in the authority and power of the works of Christ. The works of Christ. Don't take it for granted that when you say, hey, do you know the gospel? Or when you know what Jesus came to do? Don't take it for granted that to, when somebody responds to think that they know what you're talking about. They may know a little what you're talking about, but they may not totally understand it. That's why I would recommend when you're evangelizing, when you're sharing the gospel with anyone, you can just say this. You can just say, hey, so we can make sure we're talking about the same thing. Can I just tell you what the Bible says about the gospel, about Jesus? And you just tell them. And you're not insulting their intelligence. You just want to make sure you're on the same page. And that's what you would tell them. That's good. Because they're not. Or they may not be. Their faith in this cafeteria type of religion, their faith is intellectually rooted only in their understanding. There is not, it is not rooted in true faith. We have just spoken about the authority of the words of Jesus. So let's look really quickly at the authority of the works of Jesus, the authority of the works of Jesus throughout the Gospels. Jesus demonstrates his authority through uh, of the authority of his works. He performs all these miraculous signs, these miracles. And the, these miracles range from the controlling of the weather, the, the wind, the rain, and the storm, to controlling the sea, the waves, to healing the sick, to feeding the multitude, to raising the dead. His authority over all of creation, of the created order. Jesus demonstrates his authority through the works of his exorcisms. Now, think about that. We talked about that the other day in, in, in a Bible study this week. The authority of Jesus to do exorcisms, to exorcise demons. And we talked about that Jesus is the only one in Holy Scripture that ever exorcised a demon, removed a demon from somebody. And by the way, during the time that Jesus walked this earth, there were so many people possessed with demons. 
We, we asked the question the other day during our Bible study, hey, where did all the demons go? They're still here. They're still here, and they're still doing the work that we're doing when Jesus is here. They haven't gone anywhere. So we're amazed at, at how Jesus performs these exorcisms. And we cannot overlook what Scripture says about the exercising of these demons. You know, remember, and we found this interesting when we studied this the other day. Jesus exercises a legion of demons out of a man, one man, a legion of demons. A legion for the Roman army is what, 3,000 to 6,000 soldiers. And when Jesus is, is exercising these demons, he calls for their name and they say, We are legion. That means there's thousands of them in this poor man who was possessed. These demons showed damage. These demons demonstrate to us that faith goes beyond an intellectual understanding. And, and this is what we see there. And also in, in James chapter 2, verse 19, it says, You believe that God is one. You do well. But even the demons believe and shudder. See, it's more. Faith is more than just an intellectual understanding of who Jesus is. The demons knew who Jesus was or is. They identified him. But that wasn't enough. Faith goes beyond knowing about Jesus. It goes to living in trust that he is the Son of God, trusting in him, putting your trust in him. We have spoken about this on many occasions. There are many people who confess that they know Jesus, but their faith is not there. It is beyond an intellectual understanding that you could say that he is the son of God. You could say that he died for your sins. Hey, that's intellectual knowledge. But that's, faith goes beyond that. Faith is beyond that. Faith is to receive him, to receive him as Lord. Lord, meaning obedience. You submit to him and Savior. Savior means you're being saved of your sins. It means that you live and you have placed your trust in his holy hand. Jesus demonstrates his authority in the works that he completed on the cross, the work he completed on the cross. We must never forget that it is by his merit that we are saved, his works that we are saved. It is not by our merits. It is not by anything that we do. There's nothing that we do or will do that saves us. It is only by his merits. That's right. Jesus has the authority to forgive sin. The authority of Jesus is works. The authority of Jesus is works is confirmed where? How? Well, certainly, I mean, demonstration of all these miracles, but it's confirmed through his resurrection. He is raised from the dead. He rose from the dead. It's confirmed. The, his works are confirmed through his resurrection as witnessed by 500 people, 500, more than 500 people. What's your reaction to all this? What's your reaction when we read to Jesus that there was astonishment in his teaching? He's teaching as though he has, he is the authority. What is your reaction to hearing the things that Christ has said in the and the power and, and the authority that he brings, are you astonished? Are you astonished by that? Well, if you are, I, that's good, but it's not enough. Being astonished by all this is not enough. God is speaking to you in his holy word. You must respond. You must respond. And no response is a response. You have to respond. Now, some of us will ponder this and when we hear the gospel and we start reading and we start thinking, let me just think 
maybe you may just use my intellectual mind to see if this all makes sense, to see if I can believe this. That's what we do. I mean, we're intellectual beings, and Scripture's telling us that it's beyond that. It's beyond that. You know what Scripture tells us? It says that you have to be born again. You have to be a new creation to get this. That's what Jesus tells Nicodemus in, in John 3. Nicodemus of Pharisees, he comes in there and he says some nice, wonderful things about Jesus. Hey, nobody can do the things you've been doing if, he, if you weren't from God. It's obvious you're from God. And Jesus says, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you are born again, born from above. So there's the question. How do you know you're born from above? How do you know you're born again? Well, sometimes it's pretty traumatic. Sometimes you, you know something's going on and I don't know what it is. And I need somebody to help to talk to me about, tell me what's happening. And sometimes it's a little more subtle. It doesn't really register. And you think you're trying to figure it out. But there's a driving force that's driving you to come to Christ. This driving force will not be denied. This driving force is going to bring you to Christ. And it's going to, it's going to cause you voluntarily on your own volition to submit to him, to submit your life to him, to give your life to him, to receive this gift. You don't know why it's true. You don't know how you understand this. But you do because that's the that's rebirth. That is the Holy Spirit working in you. That is God. That's how you know. So now you start hungering to know more about who is this Jesus guy. But why did he have to shed blood? Who who is he? Why did he just give up on me? Man, I have done some bad things in my life. How come he just didn't just let me go? God, you know, there's billions of people that are living on this planet right now. Why didn't he let me go? That's the questions we start pondering. We start asking ourselves. We must be born again to receive this gift of grace through the life and work of Jesus Christ, which comes only through faith. If you're in Christ, if you believe you're a believer, Jesus, Jesus, through this sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, is calling you to demonstrate your faith in him by being obedient. Demonstrate your faith in him by being obedient. It's beyond our intellectual understanding. It is a trust thing. Trust in him. Trust in him. You know, I've spoken just real quick. I spoke to I speak to young people all the time. Young people meaning young, young people. Maybe teenagers and 20, 20, maybe before twenty, and, and they 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 hear this and they have questions about, like, what does trust mean? Well, I say, well, trust in trust, trust in the word of God, be, be obedient to His commandments, and so they try to put it together. I go, well, let me give you an example. What if you have a girlfriend or boyfriend, and things get a little heated? And you want to go to the next level, so to speak. Go to the next level. And then you start thinking about what does God say? What does Jesus say? What does God's word say about this? And he says, don't do it. There you go. What do you do? You're called to trust. Now, you don't know what the future, you don't know what's going to happen down the road. But you're trusting him in the moment. And you turn away. And you ask for grace to turn away. And that's just not about sex. It could be about anything. It's a trust thing. And then you're blessed. Because later on in life, you're going to meet the person that you're going to fall madly in love with, that you want to share your life with, and you have saved yourself for this person. Now, many times that doesn't happen. But God is a forgiving God. That's what he does. He forgives sin. He forgives the sin of his people. And he can make you a new creation. God is a wonderful God, and we trust in him. If you're in Christ, that's what you do. That's kingdom living in the here and now. Kingdom living in the here and now. That's you, kingdom people, living in the here and now on this side of heaven. 
Being obedient to God's word draws you nearer to him. Wow. Where do you want to be? Nearer to him. Nearer to him. Nearer to him. If you're not in Christ, if you're not committed, if you've not get, received him as your Lord and Savior, the demonic forces are whispering in your ear, this man, he's preaching, this word of God, that's, that's all messed up. It was 2,000, 3,000 years ago. Don't believe it. You can do, you're not a bad guy. You can do what you want. Demonic forces. Perhaps we need to be exercised by Jesus himself. They're there. They still exist. They're whispering in your ears right now. You reject them, and you receive Christ. There's a hymn uh, that was written back in the 1700s. Uh, the name of the hymn is, uh, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. And it goes like this. It's based on 1 Corinthians 3.11. It goes like this, in every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ, my righteousness. Let us pray. Oh, gracious Father, we do want to stop. You've been listening to Manny Alanese, pastor at St. Stephen's Chapel. For more information about our church, visit our website at stephenschapel.org or call us at 210-241-5969. Please join us prayerfully and financially as we seek to glorify God by preaching His Word and spreading the gospel of grace in boldness and selflessness.